thank you so much for all of for all of your work that you do on behalf of the board as our amazing secretary. I would just like to welcome and thank you, each of you, for your time this evening, for allowing us to share our incredible and unique services that we have provided to the most vulnerable in our community for 42 years. The Rainbow Project, I tell you, we are doing the work. Our mission is to provide restorative healing and hope for young children and their families who have experienced trauma and helping them build a foundation to master life-sustaining skills. Our vision is to create a safe, healthy, and nurturing world for children and families. Our staff has been incredible throughout this whole time of COVID. We are committed to respect and growth and compassion, collaboration, and excellence. As mentioned, during this past year, Still in COVID-19, we served over 1,200 individuals, 655 were children and 579 were adult caregivers. The age range of those served was between one years old and 85 years old. The three largest racial ethnic groups that we have been serving are white Caucasian, followed by Hispanic, Latinx, and then multiracial and mixed families. Our Rainbow Project staff provided 192 hours of training to the community in 2021, including business associate associations, early child care centers, schools, and other providers. Rainbow began providing psychiatric services to enrolled consumers, both child and adult. Our recent accomplishment has been that we joined the Northside Early Childhood Zone, in addition to the Leopold and some Prairie Zones they were already working in. Rainbow therapists are now able to provide in-home therapy to parents with children who feel isolated in all three zones. At this time, I would like to introduce to you and for you to welcome our remarkable executive director, Cheryl Cotto, who has been the longest staff member of Rainbow Project because she was the founder and creator and established this amazing, amazing organization that has sustained and helped, and helped so many in our community. I can't say, I can go on and on about Cheryl. But tonight, we know you are here to hear more information about what we do in our communities and our different projects. And you'll hear from some phenomenal, phenomenal people that work on behalf of Rainbow. So right now, I, without further ado, I will introduce and bring to you our amazing, phenomenal Cheryl oh, Cato, Executive Director of the Rainbow Project. Take it away, my dear. Oh, thank you, Carla, so much. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Uh, ooh, I, um, you know, April 2022 has come quickly, uh, and it seems not too long ago that we had our our last one. But this is really to um, acknowledge National Child Abuse Awareness Month, to say thank you to our stakeholders and very much thank our outstanding almighty uh, leadership from the board of directors and with our president, Carla Peterson Gaines, from our vice president, Treater Prestine, uh, from our uh, secretary, Dr. Ian Carroll, uh, and our treasurer, Jeffrey Butts, uh, Robin Valley Massey, and Laura uh, Hauser, Dr. Laura Hauser. Uh, these are strong leaders and we need strong leaders in our community more and more. Um, I, I'm thinking about words and words like compassion, dedication and spectacular and outstanding when I think about our staff. Um, we've had to strengthen muscles that we haven't used very much, um, such as our stamina 
uh, in Zoom meetings. Um, there are many, um, but just to say that we do have a gifted staff uh, and clinicians, and I think that's what uh, certainly keeps us all going and the successes I wished all of you could hear about uh, with sometimes some really challenging families. Um, this is an opportunity for us to say, we wanna be able to share in a deeper way, what is it that we do every day? Um, and I uh, hope that that will be something that you will be learning more and more about with all of our programs. Um, we want to thank our volunteers. We want to thank our um, community partners. Uh, also, we're excited about our future um, and hope that you will enjoy the um, little window into some of the things that we are, do that we are doing today. Um, I'm going to just very briefly talk about some of the um, uh, incidents that have been happening um, with COVID. I think that there is an underreporting of many of the things that are happening in the in the homes um, that are going unreported. Nearly 700,000 children are abused in the United States um, annually, and the youngest children um, are the most vulnerable in maltreatment. Um, oftentimes, in terms of fatalities, it is the first year. Uh, of a child's life. And then nationally, one in five, uh, one in three women and one in four men have been victims of some form of physical violence by an intimate partner uh, with, uh, within their lifetime. And then that means many of those children are growing up in those violent homes and they are also being impacted um, by trauma. Uh, approximately one in five girls and one in 20 boys will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday. Um, children most vulnerable in child sexual abuse um, incidents are between the ages of seven um, and 13. And so when we look at the Wisconsin data, we're talking about uh, close to 66,000 referrals for uh, child maltreatment, and that's in 2020. Um, in uh, Wisconsin, there were 27 substantiated cases of children dying from maltreatment in 2020. So in 2021, Dane County Child Protection Reports totaled about 4,488 reports. Um, and so uh, I think that we need to also keep in mind that this is an under probably reported uh, numbers. Uh, children in homes with violence are physically abused or seriously neglected at a rate 1500% higher than the national average. Um, children are suspended, expelled, discharged from early childhood programs and schools due to extreme behavior problems caused by the trauma that they've experienced. And lastly, child abuse and neglect costs the United States over $220 million uh, every day. Um, and investigations and foster care and hospitalization and mental health uh, and medical costs. So I want to remind you of this, uh, but also keep in mind, these are not, um, happy numbers to hear, but the prevention, early intervention and treatment work that is being done um, is really working. And so folks like Robert Anda and his researchers um, have really shown that we can reverse uh, the negative impacts of trauma. And again, we are experiencing that and want to thank all of our supporters for helping us be able to do that. Um, so I would like to move on and um, hope that you can um, be able to uh, learn more about what the Rainbow Project does. Right, <clears throat> well, thank you, Carla and Cheryl for that great welcome and update about Rainbow. Um, and now I think we'll take a closer look at some Rainbow Project programs with some spotlight presentations. 
So uh, join me in welcoming programming pr program facilitators, Serena Peloza and Kim Ethan uh, to the screen now to give us a more in-depth look at the grandparents and other relatives as parents support group. Thanks, Ian. Um, I'll start us off. My name is Serena Peloza, and I am one of the uh, facilitators for the GORP program, which stands for Grandparents and Other Relatives as Parents. Um, I have the pleasure of doing that work with Kim, who you'll hear from in a minute. Uh, just a little background on the program itself before we hear from Kim and one of the group members. The program was developed back in 2004 in response to a need that clinicians were identifying. The need being that a number of children who are coming to the clinic were um, being raised by their grandparents and or other relatives. And there was a need for these individuals to come together with their peers and to be able to get support for their unique position in the lives of the children that they care about. And so um, Rainbow was responsive to that need way back in the early 2000s. And um, there's two aspects Aspects to the program that are important to note. One is that we um, engage the community. We do that through quarterly newsletters, as well as what we call a warm line. The warm line is a response that is that the agency makes within 24, 48 hours of learning from a caregiver that they have need for emotional support and or referrals to relevant services in the community. Um, folks can contact the warm line, whether they're part of the monthly support group or not, and it's often oftentimes a avenue for folks to learn more about the monthly support group and consider joining. So um, the other aspect of the program does include that monthly support that I mentioned. The monthly support is delivered on the second Saturday of every month. We, um, when meeting in the clinic, in per, uh, we meet in person, um, but during COVID, we've been doing everything virtually. So um, the support group is two hours in length, and we have approximately 15, or I'm sorry, on average about 15 people each month. Um, and the group itself provides that peer support opportunity for processing. And it also allows for folks to get um, education about various community services that may be of interest, as well as um, special guest speakers who come and talk about relevant topics. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim, who is a co-facilitator of the group. And um, she joined us as a co-facilitator during COVID. And so it'll be nice to hear from her some of her early impressions about the group and its dynamics um, so that you all can get a sense of um, what it is that we get to experience in that peer support. Thank you, Serena. Good evening, everyone. Yes, I uh, joined the group in September of this past year, so it was a totally virtual world. And I have really admired the people in this group. Not only they have they adapted to find the energy to support young children 24 seven, but they've also learned to troubleshoot technology and still build relationships in a virtual world. So in each of the meetings that we have, there's a time when we put people in breakout sessions so two or three people can get to know each other a little bit better. And that simulates what we would have had in in-person meetings with that casual conversation that you have with people next to you um, sitting at the table before and after the meeting starts. Um, and when we are able to return to in-person meetings, we are still gonna have that virtual option because it's also given us the opportunity to have a wider reach to people who can't come in uh, to the office in person will still be able to join us virtually. And one of those other people who have joined the group since it's been in the virtual world is Sarah Shiro. And we are so grateful to her that she's willing to share with us from a grandparent's perspective, what it's like to be a part of the member of the group. So with that, Sarah, I will turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm just getting my notes here in order, so I, I wanna make sure I cover all my bases. Uh, my name is Sarah Skiro, and my husband and I are currently raising our three-year-old grandson. Um, so I've been attending uh, GORT for about a year and a half, and for the life of me, I can't remember where I heard of it, maybe a flyer. Um, I just remember reaching out and asking if they were still having a meeting and um, getting a message back from Serena saying yes. 
Um, and my hope from the group was that I could just kind of connect with other people in similar situations. It's not that easy to do. Um, even though I think people hear about relatives raising children, it, it's not uncommon, but just finding support for that particular situation um, was not that easy for me. Um, I was feeling pretty isolated, frustrated, alone, kind of like I was fumbling through the dark. Um, I just needed connection with others that have, have been there. So I was hoping for, you know, connection and feedback, guidance um, in relation to the court system, as well as family members and kind of just everything else unique to the situation where a caregiver for a child is primarily not the parent. Um, my first session, I, I would say getting there was kind of rocky. Um, when I first inquired, the meetings were in person. The first one I had a prior commitment, so I missed that. And the second one was still in person, but just before we met, um, we learned that it had moved to Zoom. And I had never Zoomed before, so I was very skeptical. And I wanna say that I maybe bowed out of two sessions because I thought, well, I'll continue when it goes in person. And we all know what happened after that. Things did not go in person, they went the other way. Um, so I, I decided, okay, I, I wanna go ahead and, and just see if I can still join up. And I decided to do the Zoom. And that was, I think, my first introduction to Zoom. Um, so my first impressions of the meetings, um, it was weird because it was on Zoom for me. Um, but after a bit, like everything just kind of fell away and I was able to focus on the group and it was like I had found my people. Um, I just instantly felt less isolated and less like an anomaly. And it was really, I, I don't think I made it through that session without crying. It was just, it was mostly just from relief in connecting with these people. Um, and I keep coming back. I've been, I've been going back, I think every month, maybe I've maybe missed one. Um, obviously we're still by zoom, but I just feel like my day is better after having attended. I just, I feel kind of like I've filled up my gas tank a bit. Um, it's just wonderful to have a corner of time to be able to exchange greetings and stories and compliments, support, tears, wisdom, uh, with people that are sharing a similar struggle. So the more meetings I go to, the better I get to know everybody and their stories, and the more I get to glean from their experiences and wisdom, but then the more I can also share as well. Um, and it's kind of nice to be on both ends, to give and receive, and it's a fellowship of sorts. And sometimes a person will articulate my exact same emotions that I haven't been able to put into words. Um, and I, I don't know if I have a word for that, but the feeling is, it, it just feels really good. Um, so if you haven't been to a group, I'm kind of thinking how, how, how I would describe it. Um, it's very diverse. So nobody fits into like a category or a stereotype. Um, all of our stories are the same and that obviously connects us, but we're all very different as well as, you know, ages, backgrounds, um, our kids' stories or, or the issues they're going through. Um, there's people there that are no longer kind of actively raising their loved one, um, but they still come and they still have information that is helpful. They still, you know, lend to ear, lend support, all that kind of stuff. And then there's people also that are, are just kind of beginners in their journey. So everybody has something to offer. So if you're someone in the same situation, I would highly encourage it. Um, GORP has helped me to work through and recognize some of my emotions that come with a challenging situation like this. Some of that is just, again, knowing that you're not the only one dealing with a certain situation, a certain situation because it can be so isolating, um, but also the validation and working through those emotions with like experienced people and being heard. Um, I'm also able to bring knowledge or skills back to my daily life, like the power to say no, for instance, or tips on how to navigate the course system or any system, even the school system. Um, so what has it been like joining uh, during COVID? Uh, that's been different. I, like I said, I was super skeptical and I did not think it was going to work for me um, at all. So that's why I was a bit hesitant, but now I am so, so grateful that I have been able to meet virtually and that, that we've had this tool through the pandemic and all of this, it's just been so nice. Um, it's enabled people that are farther away to join too. So that's been really nice. It kind of widens the reach of the group. So it incorporates more people. Um, 
And really, since I don't know any difference, I can't say like how I'd compare it to an in-person group. But what I'm looking forward to for in-person group is just that kind of energy and connection that comes with physically being with people, you know, um, reading body language, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm really looking forward to when in-person group resumes. I'm um, looking forward to hugs. We talk about hugs a lot in the group. Um, sometimes you just want to hug somebody and you can't. Um, I can bake and share cookies. That's something I wish I could do, um, but I can't do it over Zoom. But I'm also looking forward to the fact that there's a childcare option. And so we can bring our grandson with us and then my husband can participate in the group with me. So that's probably one of my, I'm, I'm very excited for that. Uh, so I hope that kind of explains all the, all the wonderful things that I get from this group. I, I, I probably can't even speak highly enough of it or the facilitators and just the chance to be a part of it. Um, so I just want to express my gratitude. The situation has not been the easiest, but having a support group like GORP has been uh, such a blessing to us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah um, and Kim and Serena just for kind of presenting on GORP and Sarah really for just sharing your experiences with the group. It really feels like you know, you've cultivated this really beautiful community, even though it's on Zoom. <laughs> um, and I very much look forward to you, like, to the time when you all can kind of like meet and be in person and, and connect in a way that you, you know, you haven't been able to before. Um, well, now I think we're going to open it up to a few questions if attendees have any. Um, so remember to please type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, and... I can kind of read them, but I guess, um, Sarah, question for you, um, if you wouldn't mind. Um, one thing that I'm thinking about, uh, I guess this is just a question for everyone who's presented on GORP so far, but, you know, being on Zoom is a very different experience than being in person. And I'm just curious, like, what are some of the things that you've done, you've all have done or noticed that kind of helps with building that community in a virtual space? Or what are some of the things that you've appreciated about what facilitators have done? Um, I have liked that, uh, I think that either Kim or Serena mentioned that we have a breakout session in the beginning. And so it's, it's just kind of a little smaller group. I've had it like three people, four people, and then one time it was just me and one other person. So that was kind of nice to be able to connect that way. Um, there's a very, open feeling to the meetings, like people will put in their phone numbers so that we can connect or, um, you know, we, we've gotten update emails uh, from Kim and Serena. So that's been kind of nice connecting that way. Um, they share a lot of information for us, but it, you know, I don't know what the trick is, but they, they've done a very good job at, at making us, I think, still feel like we're kind of sitting around in a room together. So that's been really pleasant. Like, I don't feel like I'm missing out on on too terribly much. So um, so I, I just feel like they've done a really good job at just making us all feel welcome and a part of a group and and feel like we're in the same room, even though physically we're not, we, we are sharing the same space together. And I was say Kim or Serena, any sort of like thoughts you have about like the things you've done to try to, you know, bring that community space into like the online space one of the things that we did um, usually november is caregiver appreciation month so we try to do something special it was a little tough this year since we couldn't be together in person but one of the things we did was um, we asked for people to submit recipes and actually it was sarah's that we chose and we all baked the same cookies with our families and then we brought those baked cookies to our meeting and ate them together even though we couldn't share what we had baked with each other we um, ate that together to try to have some of that community time and talked about what it was like to bake those recipes that we had done i really love that like thinking about different ways to like get people to engage even though you're not in the same space. Yeah, that's really, really awesome. Um, one of the question I was sort of thinking about is like, you know, um, GORP seems like such a tightly knit community and 
you know, do grandparents kind of um, stay a part of the community for a long period of time? Do they kind of like discontinue after a certain point? Like, what do you, what do folks usually do um, with GORP in terms of like how long they're a part of the group? Um, they, they probably know better than me, but there, there are people, I think of two people that have been coming ever since I have that are, I would say graduates of the group in a way. Um, and they still come and attend. And I think, you know, as anybody would know, as a parent, parenting doesn't really just end at 18, it, it continues on. So I think there's definitely value in those people that are coming back. But I think it also speaks to how connected and helpful and kind of what a family from what I'm seeing um, the group is that those people are still coming back, even if they maybe don't even, you know, really need to, they still feel a need to. Um, and then the cookie thing, I didn't even think of that. So that's how good these two people are at, <laughs> at forming community. And I, I didn't even think of that. It just felt natural and it, and it was really fun. Okay, I'll, let me see if there's any, if there are any other questions in the Q&A box. I don't see any. Um, so, you know, I want to thank you all so much just for like such a fantastic presentation. Um, and yeah, GORP just seems like such an amazing, supportive space for folks. And I'm just really appreciative of all of you really for being, you know, like facilitating the group and also just being active and engaged in it. Um, so thank you all so much just for being a part of GORP. Um, well, now I think um, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to the uh, to Samantha Burr, our child and family therapist, um, so she can share a little bit more about the Bounce Back program. It's all yours, Samantha. Hey, thanks again. So I'm Samantha. I'm a child and family therapist at Rainbow and also the coordinator of the Bounce Back program. So Bounce Back is a group intervention for elementary age students who have experienced stress and trauma. The goal of the Bounce Back group is to help students learn coping strategies to recover from their experiences and bounce back and feel better. This group consists of 12 week, or excuse me, of 10 weeks of skill building sessions held at school. The curriculum is evidence-based and includes cognitive and behavioral components. Some of the skills learned are feelings identification, relaxation strategies such as deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, mindfulness. Um, they also learn some cognitive coping skills. So that would be learning what unhelpful thoughts are and how to replace them with more helpful ones that make them feel brave and courageous. Um, they learn about social support and also problem solving. And then another big part of the Bounce Back group is parent and caregiver involvement. So parents and caregivers get to learn the same skills that the students do during group through parent sessions that are included. The students and parents also get to have a session together in which the student gets to share a story that they've created about their stressor or their traumatic experience. So at the Rainbow Project, we partner with the Madison Metropolitan School District to deliver bounce back to second, third, and fourth grade students. And this is our fourth year doing that. The partnership includes a school staff member, usually a social worker or psychologist, with a mental health clinician. So that could be a clinician from Rainbow. And we also have some other partner agencies that help us facilitate. And this partnership is really utilizing both the expertise of the school staff and then the clinician to provide a safe and meaningful group experience for the kids. Bounce Back has played a significant role in supporting young children and families that have experienced stress and trauma because it helps eliminate some of the barriers that families might experience when seeking mental health services. Some of these barriers can include transportation difficulties, if it's hard to get to appointment at an outpatient clinic, 
sometimes there's a larger time commitment when attending appointments outside of school that can be really difficult for families. Um, also just the ability to complete treatment can be really challenging if the family has scheduling restrictions or just other stressors that make it really difficult to be consistent when attending. And then sometimes families can also experience barriers with just different insurances and how their access to services might change. But the great thing with bounce back is that since it's delivered in the school, we can reduce a lot of these barriers for the students and families. We've been able to see some great outcomes with bounce back in the past few years. When the students start group, we gather information about the reactions that they're having to their stress and trauma. And then at the end of group, we also kind of come back and look at those. And at the end of group, we see a significant reduction in their symptoms and reactions that they're having from the stressors. So we're seeing that these groups are really helping the students feel better. Another great outcome that we've noticed from Bounce Back is that the group really helps to build and support trusted relationships between the students and the adults at school and then their parents and caregivers at home. And then another great outcome is that it really helps build a supportive community of their peers in school too. So it's super validating for the kids to meet other students that have gone through something stressful and traumatic and have similar feelings too. So last year we experienced a success in kind of adapting to the COVID-19 pandemic and was able to facilitate bounce back virtually. So with our partnership with the school staff and students in some of the buildings, we created a virtual group space using Google Slides and Bit Emoji. So this kind of provided a fun and interactive way for the students to still be together and learn from one another. And at the end of each of our groups, we do satisfaction surveys where the students get to give us feedback. And it was really cool to see last year's because the most frequent comment from students was just how much fun it still was and how they really enjoyed being with their peers when that wasn't something that they weren't really getting during their academic time. And which is kind of a big contrast to when we first had groups in person, I feel like we would usually get feedback at the end of the year from kids being like, oh, I really like the snack we had and kind of that stuff. Whereas um, doing the groups virtually through the pandemic really strengthened that peer connection. And then this year we've been able to successfully transition back to facilitating in person, which has felt really good. Um, and just with the pandemic, we've seen an increase in the need of bounce back. So we've been able to respond and facilitate 26 groups in the elementary schools and just really continue to see how resilient of a program and curriculum it is and are super excited to see how it continues to grow next year as well. All right, well, thank you so much, Sam, uh, for kind of just really, you know, describing bounce back. I think it's such a cool, like if you really think about it, right, like kids go through two kind of main like systems, one healthcare and the other education. And by like, per, like you said, providing the care in a school setting um, and in a way where that you're reducing all those barriers, you just make access to trauma-informed services so much more um, accessible. So that's fantastic. Um, I was just curious, like what are some of the like types of like stressful things or traumas that kids are, are coping with now that you've seen in Bounce Back? Yeah, it's a pretty wide range of like stresses and trauma. I, I feel like in some ways COVID has been like a connection that everyone has, which is nice, but still seeing like lots of families experiencing different types of loss, like separation, um, divorce that might happen between parents. And then also, um, you know, sexual abuse, um, neglect, physical abuse, all those things are still coming up as well. But the cool thing about Bounce Back is the participants don't share their traumatic experiences with their peers, but everyone knows they've been through something difficult. So it's, it's kind of like you get to 
have that validation without having to share all the details with your peers too. Really cool. And what do you think, like, are there things that you've noticed that, you know, when in that model of like school-based care with peers that like is really special about bounce back or something that you really love or excited about with bounce back? Yeah, I think it kind of addresses some of the stigma that comes with mental health and trauma. Um, when kids experience trauma, the whole family experiences trauma. And oftentimes it can be really challenging for parents to know how to talk about it or to even just feel comfortable talking about it. So Bounce Back kind of creates that space and opportunity for everyone to have a chance to talk about it um, and not feel like they need to keep it to themselves. Um, and it's like still fun for the kids too. I, I feel like oftentimes people are like, oh, why would, why would kids wanna come to a group to talk about trauma? But the kids are always like, excited to join in and to be together. Very cool. Um, well, you know, Samantha, we very much appreciate, appreciate all the work that you're doing and, you know, thank you for sharing, but thank you so much for serving our kids and serving our community. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so next up, we're going to hear from Celia Huerta and Jonathan Martinez. Uh, they are both uh, bilingual child and family therapists. Um, and they're going to be speaking on an array of Latinx uh, focus program at the Rainbow Project. So I'll let y'all take it away. All right. Thank you, Ian. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan Martinez. I'm one of the bilingual child and family therapists. And I will be, I will be presenting with my colleague, Celia Huerta, if Celia wants to introduce herself. You're on mute, Celia. Hello, everybody. I'm Celia Huerta, a bilingual, bicultural child, adult, and family psychotherapist. Thank you, Celia. And today we'll be talking about the Latinx specific services that Rainbow provides. So, as some of you may know, the Latinx community is one of the fastest growing populations in the US and the largest minority group in Wisconsin. Latinos represent 18% of the workforce and own over 4 million businesses across the countries. And Latinos start and grow businesses at nearly twice the rate of the general population. But despite these, fact, uh, these facts, Latinos are the largest uninsured group in the US and tend to underutilize or drop out of services and programs more often than other populations. Um, it is estimated that one out of two Latinos drop out of mental health programs or services and this could be attributed to language, cultural differences, or even inadequate rapport. Um, in addition to this, Latinos also have several risk factors for this population that can lead to more severe mental illness, and that can include high poverty levels, high incidence of domestic violence, physical and emotional abuse, increased alcohol and drug abuse, traumatic experiences, exploitation at work, and even family conflicts due to acculturation differences between parents and children. So as we try to close the gap for cultural specific services for this population, Rainbow offers several specific Latino programs. Um, and we'll start with Celia introducing our Latina mothers group. And while she will be doing that, I will be highlighting a presentation of some photos and some information for the groups we, we have at Rainbow. Go ahead, Celia. We have the, the Mujer a Mujer uh, group, which is a Spanish speaking support group for Latina women with depression and anxiety. And it is a weekly support group that has continued meeting via Zoom throughout the pandemic. Its focus is on symptom identification and management, and it helps reduce isolation and create that sense of universalism. The women in the group learn about healthy versus unhealthy behaviors and relationships. We do uh, safety planning and resource connections during the increase in domestic violence throughout the pandemic, especially. We talk about ways to help children cope, ways to create more structure, in their day and ways to create recreational activities that also promote uh, a stronger attachment. Throughout the pandemic, we've provided coping, coping kits for our clients. 
uh, given that we're not able to do uh, or haven't been able to do as many um, in-person sessions. And that's been really helpful. And again, with the focus um, or, that, or emphasizing that um, development or strengthening in the, the rela parent-child relationships. We focused more on processing and coping um, with grief as some of our members have lost relatives um, and re related to uh, COVID. So that's been, um, those have been um, added issues that um, the members have experienced. And um, some of the referrals for the group come from clinics, social service agencies. Um, we have worked, or I have worked um, with some of the, the members, children's uh, school social workers, teachers, in terms of advocating for them and just supporting the, the, the moms in the learning process and as they learn how to support them um, during their, their classes. And we do, um, when we do a group in person, we also provide childcare snacks and have um, community service providers who share important information with them. Thank you, Celia. Um, so to start with some of the other programs we have, I wanted to begin with our girls group that we offer for Latinx girls called Soy Yo Soy Unica Soy Latina. And it is an eight to 10 week program for Latinx girls between the ages of eight to 12, where we also dedicate two weeks for parents or care providers to discuss the group and share psychoeducation about mental health and the importance of connecting with the children and the youth. Um, but some of the topics that we do talk about in our group are focused on um, cultural values, healthy self-esteem, healthy relationship, managing emotions and stress, as well as resolving conflict and healthy communications. Our, this group tends to be very popular um, and there tends to be around, I believe we had 15 girls last time and it's a lot of fun. It's definitely one of my favorite groups that we facilitate uh, where we create a bunch of different games where we can attach kind of these themes um, and topics and make them fun and easy to open up and talk with. Um, one of the great outcomes that we have is just creating this space for these girls where they can feel vulnerable as well as connected to other girls who share the same identity as well as experiences as them. So I just wanted to share some photos of this group. First, we have our clapping game and some of the old clients that we that were part of these group over the years. Um, here's our flyer. And we also have our other facilitator and bilingual child family therapist, Monica, with our group in the middle. Um, and it's just us kind of connecting and playing games and dividing them up. Um, and this has been always a great experience and a really fun time for the girls. And every week for this group, we have a mantra that we, a mantra that we share and we recite um, and the girls really get into it. And actually at the end of the group, they get a copy of this mantra that they can hold on to just to remind them of empowerment and being and proudness of their, bi, their bicultural identity and how important that is for them and feeling unique and having feeling empowered. Um, and here's just some of the games we talk about where identifying emotions and really connecting it with their bodies and different parts of their bodies of where they feel emotions. As you can see, it's a very popular group and they're having a lot of fun. Um, and at the end of the, of the program, we offer a certificate and then we have a kind of a graduation ceremony where the family can see some of the work they've done and just kind of connect with other families that have participated in the group. So in addition to this, we also have our Latinx boys group called El Chale Ganas, uh, which is also a 10 week program that focuses on processing and defining what it means to be a Latino boy slash Latino male. We discuss the expectations and cultural assumptions that come with being a Latino male, in addition to other topics such as cultural values, the importance of self-esteem, trauma, managing emotions, and of course, coping skills. Our groups have been highly successful in creating a safe space for our boys to discuss and connect with these topics. And again, being able to touch on themes and topics uh, in a more vulnerable way 
and in a safe space where they have other kiddos that have had the same experience. Um, so here's our flyer that we've had and a couple of the kids working on some of the different activities where we've either created masks um, or they've created their own kind of identity board um, and kind of plan out what do what would they like to be in the future and what are things that they enjoy and they love for themselves. And we've also created a mantra here for this group as well um, that they were able to receive a copy and we recite every day, um, touching upon the same themes of feeling empowerment of being a Latino male and how to have a healthy relationship with that identity. Um, and just fully understanding what does it mean to be a Latino male. And this is our certificate that they have earned at the end of our program. And we have the same kind of similar ceremony with the families where we invite their parents, care providers, or other relatives to share the work that they've been doing across uh, over the past 10 weeks and just kind of take pride in um, the, the hard work they've put in during the group. So lastly, one of the final programs we want to talk about is the Platicas, and I'll let Celia finish up. The Rainbow also collaborates with the Formando Lazos Familiares program, which is under uh, the Latino Health Council. And this program facilitates monthly platicas or workshops on topics that address issues or trends that we see in the community. For example, uh, during the time when we were having uh, repeated INS visits, we talked a lot about um, the uh, civil rights and ways to cope with uh, PTSD symptoms. Um, also, uh, we've talked a lot about ways to cope with pandemic stress, how to um, deal with, um, again, grief and loss. And um, we had a workshop where there were a lot of uh, different service providers in the communities where, where they talked about how to, how to get um, assistance for rent, for utilities, and things like that. Uh, we also talk a lot about acculturation issues and how to deal with uh, acculturation differences with children that are born here. Um, and we talk also a, a lot about um, parenting and uh, during times when there's a, a suicide or other tragedy or loss in the Latino community, those are topics that we also bring up in conversations. Uh, this program also does complimentary radio shows that are able to reach bigger audiences, including uh, Latinos in isolated rural areas. And when in person, we provide uh, childcare and dinner. We've also done trainings for service providers in the community and ways to improve service provision to Latino families. Last but not least, Rainbow is also a member of the Latinx Mental Health Coalition that is made up of community service providers that work predominantly with Latinx families. And some of the, the members uh, represent agencies such as the Latino Health Council, again, RICE, Access, uh, the Immigration Affairs Program, UW Counseling Psych Esperanza Program, Centro Hispano, UW Health, and, and several others. And so in these meetings, we talk about gaps in access to mental health services for Latinx in the, in the county. And we plan strategies and meet with our county leaders um, to talk about um, changes needed in the community, uh, ways to break down systemic barriers, the importance and need for um, increased accountability for agencies that receive federal funding that break federal laws regarding the use of train interpreters and translators. Um, also, we talk about um, the importance and the need in, in community agencies to improve their practices, practices that are uh, trauma-informed and culturally responsive, and uh, also the importance of making improvements in recruitment and retention strategies of bilingual bicultural service providers. Those are our, our programs in a yep. short time. Yes. 
thank you all for listening, by the way. Yeah, and I just want to thank you both for sharing. I think one thing that <clears throat> I've always been impressed by the work that you all do and Rainbow is like, you know, in mental health, the history of mental health is very much viewed, at least in Western practices of mental health, viewed people outside of their own cultural identity. And I think you all have done such a fantastic job of not, you know, pretending that that doesn't exist and tailoring interventions to be specific to folks' cultural identity. And not only that, like there are folks from the Latin community serving those folks in the community. So um, I'm just always impressed by the work that you all do um, and just want to give you all the props for it because it's something that many mental health providers are not actively thinking about and aren't doing well. <laughs> Appreciate that, Ian. Um, yeah, of course. One question I guess I have from you all is like what, you know, in all the different programming, right, that you've done, um, what have been some of the, like, what are some of the things that you've noticed that kids take away after programming? Like certain things that like, you know, a kid leaves and something that really sticks with them. I think uh, definitely increased pride, you know, more af affirmation in regards to just how beautiful they are, you know, in, in the awesome, the richness in, in their culture. And also um, the diversity within the Latino culture, that there's a lot of variety, you know, we all, we come from different countries, you know, there's some differences despite all of our similarities. And just the beauty of it all, right? Again, that the appreciation for diversity and pride, you know, I think uh, being able to mirror each other in each other, you know, and just see uh, the beauty and the strength, the resilience in each other. Um, again, that element of universalism is so powerful. Yeah, I think with that, I, I was going to say um, mattering. It's a sense of when I, a lot of times when we start the group, there's a lot of hesitation, there's a lot of quietness and a lot of early remarks of, I didn't think I was gonna like this. Um, and it, they challenge that and they feel connected with the other kids who participate in both groups. Um, and I feel like that has to do with mattering that they're not the only ones that deal with the struggles at home. They're not the only ones who are, right, Latinos. Um, and that may seem like such an obvious thought, but sometimes it doesn't feel that way, especially in Madison, Wisconsin. I think having these small groups where you're able to hear stories and connect with other kids, it really makes you feel like you're important. It makes you feel like you matter. And I think that's one of the things that I've noticed that the girls and the boys take away from both groups. Yeah, I mean, I very much appreciate those answers and like, you know, such a core piece of well-being, like you said, in Madison, Wisconsin, for folks who are minoritized is that sense of like cultural identity and pride in cultural identity. So not only are you able to provide the amazing interventions, you're able to build community, but you're also doing that identity work that really, you know, fosters resilience and well-being. So um I just want to say thank you to you both. Thank you. Um, very much appreciate you all presenting on everything and thank you for the work you do. Um, our last program spotlight is going to be presented by Monica Madrigal, um, another bilingual bicultural child and family therapist uh, and the quarter coordinator of the Early Childhood Zones program. All you, Monica. Thanks, Ian. Um, good evening, everybody. So again, my name is Monica Madrigal. I'm a bilingual child and family therapist at the Rainbow Project. And I am gonna be talking a little bit about the Early Childhood Stones program today. Um, and I'll be referring to it as just the Stones program for short. Um, so the Stones program is a collaborative effort between various Dane County early childhood home visiting programs that are all really committed to address social and emotional needs of families who are either currently pregnant or who have children under the age of four. And then the Rainbow Project specifically collaborates with this program to provide culturally professional 
addition, home-based mental health services to the families, again, participating in the SONES program. The services uh, for the SONES program are geographically focused um, with the goal of really increasing resources, increasing a sense of connectedness to their community and stabilizing communities of high need in Dane County. So just a little bit of background around the SONES program. In 2013, the Dane County Department of Human Services and United Way of Dane County launched the first early childhood SONES in the Leopold School enrollment area. And then in 2014, uh, the Sun Prairie SONE was then launched. So currently the SONES program provides services in three different zones. There's a Leopold zone, the Sumprey zone, and the Northside zone. And the Rainbow Project does provide mental health services for all three zones. The zone services are really grounded in the knowledge that um, families are more successful when parents and children have access to responsive, comprehensive, and community-based support. And so the zones follows this really integrative approach of various agencies working together with families. Um, individuals who are interested in the zones programs begin working with a core home visiting program, and they provide a range of free services, including uh, family stability case management, uh, support for an education about having a healthy pregnancy, uh, promoting positive parent-child relationships, uh, child development information, and school readiness assistance. So some of the core home visiting programs include uh, the Dane County Public Health Nurse Family Partnership, Prenatal Care Coordination, the RISE Early Childhood Initiative, Welcome Baby and Beyond, Parent Child Plus, Reach Dane Early Head Start Program, and the Children's Wisconsin Kinder Ready Programs. So one once a family is kind of connected with one of those programs, the family is then offered other home visiting services that enhance the core programs. And so these enhancement services include like assistance for securing and or maintaining stable housing, support and working towards employment and education goals, and also just an opportunity to receive mental health services. And again, this is where the Rainbow Project comes in and provides those mental health services. So our goal at the Rainbow Project in this collaboration is to provide mental health services, including assessments, interventions, referrals, and advocacy for children and their families who have either experienced trauma, early relational attachment challenges, or any other mental health concerns. And we do provide under this program dyadic services, so services between a child and their parent if the child is too young to participate in treatment individually. And we also provide individual services for the caregivers. In the past, we have seen that around 60 to 65 percent of mothers who are involved in the SONES program have met criteria for mental health concerns. And so when an individual meets criteria or they're just simply interested in mental health services, they are then referred to a clinician at the Rainbow Project. We then end up working with these families on improving their social emotional well-being by um, either enhancing their emotional regulation skills, building up coping tools, processing traumas or uh, providing parenting support and skills when needed. Um, I think a really important thing to note about the SONES program is that home visiting really is at the core of this program. And it's really, really important because we are able to meet families where they are at, both emotionally, but also physically as well. Um, we oftentimes do see that individuals might have obstacles in participating and really engaging in services, such as like lack of funds or transportation issues or childcare needs, among other reasons. And so when we do provide home-based services, we do address some of these obstacles because they, for one, don't have to worry about coming to an office setting, and we can just go into their homes and provide services there. Um, Home-based mental health services are also beneficial for the therapeutic relationship because a lot of the times people feel a lot more comfortable in their homes, and we have seen that some people feel really comfortable in their home environment, and this comfort brings people to be a little bit more open and a little bit more expressive about their concerns and uh, past experiences. This also really uh, provides us with an opportunity to just observe kind of these natural interactions between family members and observe how people use their space, which are really helpful tools for treatment. And that is something that we oftentimes would not see in an office setting, because I think people are just a little bit more relaxed or just more comfortable in their own home settings that we get to see how they interact with their space and again, with their um, other family members. 
Um, another really important aspect of the SOMS program is our collaboration with other service providers. And I think that this is really key because when we are collaborating with other service providers, it really gives families a sense that they have a team that they can count on and they can reach out to any of the providers um, and makes them feel really supported. And aside from that, I think that the collaboration really allows the team to serve the families better because when we're working as separate individual agencies, there's times where we might just misinformation or we may feel disconnected or it just uh, there's a lot of work on one particular service provider and so when we're working as a team we really discuss like our roles and in the team and also just our roles and how to support one another and which all leads really to positive impacts with families. So we have found that like collaboration and the whole visiting aspects of this program have been really successful um, and important aspects of the SOMS program. Um, and then in addition to just the individual mental health services that we provide, we also provide mental health consultation and educational support to home visitors and other individuals working in the SONES program. Um, consultations are more for the service providers and they're just around questions for around mental health or any concerns that they might have. And it, again, it's like our attempt to bridge that collaboration and to provide support to service providers. Um, some common consultation questions that we've gotten in the past is like service providers wondering um, how they can talk to family members about uh, mental health issues or how they can, how and when to know when to refer families to mental health services. Um, and then lastly, uh, presentations. We also do provide presentations when we're asked to provide some. Um, we presented in the past on topics such as supporting early childhood, childhood mental health needs, um, grief and loss in young families, and addressing mental health needs during COVID. So this is just a quick overview of the SONES program. And again, uh, the overall goal of the SONES program really is family stabilization, improvement in health and well-being, and support for child development and school readiness. And through the collaboration with all of the other agencies, we have seen that there has been success in some of these areas. And that is the SONES. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monica. We'll we'll open it up for questions again. But, you know, it's what's so cool about the zones is that like we know that there are so many factors that go into like family well-being and like child well-being. And by being able to work across different like, you know, organizations, you're able to do things like housing, right? And and some of those things that are necessary before you can really start to provide intervention. Right. Um what do you think? I mean, you talked a lot about the in-home piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, do families like 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 it when you come to their homes? You mentioned it reduces barriers, right? But I could imagine some families would be like, well, I don't know if I want you in my house. Yeah. Uh, um, so some, some families do really enjoy that aspect of it. I think it's just convenient for us to just go into their homes. There are other families who, like you're mentioning, right, they don't necessarily enjoy that aspect as well for whatever reason. Um, but I think that with the Stones family, there are specific locations, too, that we can utilize um, for um, home visiting, for just other services. I know that if they don't wanna come all the way to Rainbow, they, we do have like a Leopold zone office, there's a Northside zone office. So there are other options for them um, that we don't, that if they don't want to um, do the home service. Very cool, okay. Um, one question we have is, how many Rainbow therapists are involved in early childhood zones? Um, we have right now, four of us that are working in the zones. Yeah, four, four clinicians. Very cool. And, and, and when we think about early childhood, you know, the age range of, of kiddos that we see tends to be what, what age range? In the zones program? Mm -hmm. From all the way from birth to, um, I think one of our kiddos was like around seven from the zones program. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about what like intervention around birth looks like? Yeah, so with that, I think it's mo mainly working with the parent individually. Um, and I think a lot of the times we have from the Stones program, a lot of mothers who are younger, who maybe it's their first child. So we kind of just talk about their comfort level, um, just kind of their worries around parenting um, and how they can kind of really facilitate that attachment with their child. Because I think a lot of times there is a lot of worry around that. So when it is a really young child, I think that we focus more around that. Cool. Yeah, I appreciate. I think um, 
you know, sometimes intervention with a kid who's just bored, we're like, what does that even look like? But that I think is a really, you know, helpful picture. And it's just so cool that you're able to kind of work with kids uh, and in family systems, you know, at a really crucial time in kids' development. So um, thank you, Monica. Very yeah. much appreciate the work you do. Always good to see you. Um, and, you know, now I think what we'll do is we will kind of give the floor to Cheryl and Carla um, to kind of present some closing remarks. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to, as board chair, I will always let our executive director go last uh, because her words are so critical and important. But I just want to thank everyone who took the time out today to be with us. And I'm hoping that you have learned more about the great work that we're doing at the Rainbow Project and uh, uh, knowing that, that we have your support. And again, we thank you for spending your time this evening and we so appreciate it. And with that, I will turn it over to our executive director, Cheryl Cotton. Thank you, uh, thank you, Carla. Uh, but see what I mean? See what I mean about the staff? Um, it is amazing. It is amazing. Um, we are one of hundreds of agencies in, in the county. And I know, and with so much pride and emotion, because I know what is um, going on day to day with such gifted clinicians, uh, that you are working with challenges, many, many challenges. Um, very complex, uh, very serious. And yet the clinicians not only have the wisdom uh, to, to know what to do uh, on a deeper level than most are not aware of, they also have been able to uh, develop trust and relationships with people who have very, you know, have very good reason not to trust. And they are, and the clinicians are the vehicle, no matter how wonderful the approach uh, is, is they are the ones who connect. And it's so important um, that this, uh, this is the quality that makes the Rainbow Project so different. And it is very difficult to explain that um, because we all have buzzwords about trauma services, but there really is a difference and so we are providing this program uh, for our stakeholders so that we can provide that depth um, and information um, uh, to you. Um, if you have questions, if you have more questions about the Rainbow Project and services, please contact us. Um, check out our volunteer needs and please um, you will all be receiving um, a feedback survey, and we hope that if you have ideas, um, if you have other thoughts about programming, um, please, please do um, participate in that, and we would definitely appreciate it. But I just want to thank everyone for taking the time. Uh, this is a, a time when um, resiliency can can be wearing thin uh, and uh, for everyone. And I just know that the staff here, the families here that we are working with are working hard themselves. Um, that's what inspires me. That's what inspires uh, the energy to continue the commitment uh, and the leadership that the board is giving. Uh, I just so appreciate it. So thank you very much.